Territorial Acknowledgement. Community Education Service acknowledges that the land on which we virtually gather today is the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta. The City of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. Good evening. Thank you for attending the second presentation in our series on specific learning disorders. Tonight we'll be discussing specific learning disorders with impairment in written expression, what parents and teachers should know. I'll be presenting alongside my colleague Claire and then due to unforeseen circumstances, Brittany isn't able to join us this evening, but hopefully she'll be back next week. As some of you may already know, you might remember me from last week. My name is Ocean. I'm a master's student in School and Applied Child Psychology at the University of Calgary here in Alberta. Prior to moving to this province, I completed my Bachelor of Arts Honours degree in Psychology at the University of Regina. I'm passionate about collaborating with students, their parents, and teachers to develop and implement strategies that help students reach their full academic potential and experience enhanced mental well-being. And my name is Claire, and I'm currently a PhD student in the University of Calgary School and Applied Child Psychology program. I completed my master's degree at the University of Calgary and my undergraduate degree at the University of Toronto. Over the last two years, I worked with a number of children through tutoring, volunteering in a classroom, and working in a variety of research settings. I have a passion for working with children to help them succeed socially, emotionally, and academically. I also enjoy working with teachers and parents to develop a plan of support. So before we begin, I just want to reiterate what Wendy said. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to drop them in the chat as soon as you think of them, and then we'll answer as many as possible at the end of our presentation. Depending on time constraints, though, we might not be able to answer all of your questions this evening. However, if this happens, written responses to your questions will be provided to you afterwards. On that note, I'd like to inform you uh, that Wendy has sent out responses to last week's questions from the reading presentation. And then now we'll be moving on to this evening's agenda. Some of this presentation will be a bit of a review of important concepts that we discussed last week. So that might be um, old information if you attended last week, but the rest of it will be content that will aid in your knowledge of specific learning disorders and it'll introduce additional information for you. Our learning objectives today are as follows. To understand the core components of specific learning disabilities and written expression. To acquire knowledge about the referral and testing process for psychoeducational assessments and to learn about specific evidence-based resources to help students, families, and school personnel teams navigate students' unique academic challenges. To begin, Claire will talk about the history of language development. All right, so thinking about the history of writing, our first true verbal language probably developed between 30,000 to 100,000 years ago. If verbal language lets me tell someone next to me what's happening inside my head, writing lets me tell someone 500 miles away or 500 years from now. If you think about this, writing was a major world-changing invention, first with symbols, cave paintings, and pictograms. Communicating with each other completely changed human history, allowing us to expand across the globe and share our best ideas with each other. All right, so let's think critically about the progression of writing throughout history. Writing started out as pictorial diagrams found in caves and progressed to symbols that eventually became the 26 letters of the English alphabet. However, currently with the heightened use of telecommunication, such as instant messaging, individuals are beginning to use emojis and GIFs instead of actual words to communicate. As emojis and GIFs invade our written communication, researchers have suggested that emojis is now more frequently seen as, highly, as a highly creative form of language. It appears that old language has adapted to our new society to meet the challenges of message size and texting constraints. However, what would the implications that this may have for the future development of students' written skills? 
Now, before we get ahead of ourselves to talk about writing, let's talk about what a specific learning disorder in writing looks like. Did you know Da Vinci and Lewis Carroll used pictograms when writing? All right, so before I begin to discuss what a learning disorder is, I just wanted to let you know that, um, like Ocean said, some of the information will be a review for those of you who attended last week's presentation. So please bear with us. That being said, what is a learning disorder? A learning disorder is a neurological disorder that affects the way a person stores, understands, retrieves, and or communicates information. Learning disorders are invisible and lifelong and can occur alongside other disorders. For example, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and anxiety. It is crucial to understand that learning disorders are not the same as intellectual disabilities indicating that intelligence is not a contributing factor to the difficulties experienced by those with a learning disorder. Living with a learning disorder can have an ongoing impact on friendships, school, work, self-esteem, and daily life. However, people with learning disorders can succeed when solid coping skills and strategies are developed, and that's why we're here today to discuss. So how is a learning disorder diagnosed? In the world of diagnosis, there are two divergent definitions of a learning disorder that can be used to assess students' difficulties. First is the DSM, or Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, and the other is LDAC, or the Learning Disabilities of Canada. The DSM states that a learning disorder is when an individual has difficulties learning and is using academic skills that persist for at least six months despite the provision of interventions that target those difficulties. According to the DSM, the affected academic skills must be substantially and quantifiably below those expected for the individual's age and must cause significant interference with academic or occupational performance. As confirmed by a clinical assessment that will be Discuss, that we will be discussing later on. The learning difficulties have to begin during school age years, but may not become fully manifested until the demands for those affected academic skills exceed the individual's limited capacities. The DSM states that learning difficulties are not better accounted for by intellectual disabilities. And the second definition, psychologists often use to diagnose learning difficulties is the Learning Disabilities Association of Canada that indicates that learning disabilities refer to a number of disorders which may affect the acquisition, organization, retention, understanding, or use of verbal or nonverbal information. These disorders affect learning in individuals who otherwise demonstrate at least average abilities essential for thinking and or reasoning. There are three specific learning disorders, reading, math, and written expression. However, today's presentation will be focused on difficulties with written expression. Did you know written language disorders affect at least 10% of school-aged children? All right, so a specific learning disorder in written expression is characterized by accuracy in spelling, grammar, and punctuation. Children with the SLD in written expression can have challenges with spelling. For example, they may add, omit, or substitute vowels or consonants, along with grammar or punctuation errors within sentences, employing poor paragraph organization and often lacking clarity of ideas in written expression. Writing is a complex task requiring the mastery and integration of a number of sub-skills. The process of writing connects cognition, language, and motor skills. 
Some children have difficulties in one aspect of the process, such as producing legible handwriting or spelling, whereas other children have difficulty organizing and sequencing their ideas. Difficulties in one area can delay skill development in other areas. Children often experience this disorder as thoughts moving faster in their mind than their hand can translate them into written ideas on the page. Many different terms can be used to describe written language difficulties, such as developmentally, developmental output failure, writing disorder, writing problems, disorder of written expression, problems in written expression, writing disabilities, and dysgraphia. Learning disorders can range in severity based on the number of skills, based on the number of skill areas affected and the severity of the difficulties. Typically, the more skill areas that are affected, the higher the degree of impairment, and in turn, the more severe the learning disorder. A mild specific learning disorder would be diagnosed if a student has some difficulties learning skills in one or two academic domains, and they may be able to function well when provided with appropriate accommodations or support. A moderate specific learning disorder is due to marked difficulties learning skills in one or more academic domains, and is when the individual is unlikely to become proficient without some intervals of intensive and specialized teaching. Some accommodations or supportive services, at least part of the day at school, or in the workplace may be needed to complete activities accurately and efficiently. A severe specific learning disorder would be diagnosed when one has severe difficulties learning skills, affecting several academic domains, and the individual is likely to learn those skills without ongoing intensive individualized and specialized training. Even with an array of appropriate accommodations or services at home or at school, the individual may not be able to complete all activities efficiently. The term dysgraphia may commonly be used to describe difficulties with written expression. For example, trouble forming letter shapes, having difficulties following a line or staying within margins, having trouble with sentence structure or following rules of grammar when writing, but not when speaking, and difficulty organizing or articulating thoughts on paper. The National Center for Learning Disabilities specify that children with dysgraphia generally have trouble with the mechanics of writing and exhibit other fine motor impairments while dysgraphia in adolescents and adults often manifests as difficulties with grammar, syntax, comprehension, and generally putting thoughts on paper. However, it is important to note that dysgraphia is not recognized by the American Psychological Association in the DSM-5. Instead, the DSM-5 lists problems in writing, as well as in reading and math, under the specific learning disorder diagnosis category. The category also includes the specifier, SLD with impairment in written expression, which is most closely aligned with common notions of dysgraphia. In order to understand difficulties in written expression, it is important to understand the progression of writing skill development. First, it begins by simply learning to handwrite. This is followed by learning how to spell, and then these skills are used to compose written sentences and paragraphs. The first skill to develop is the ability to handwrite. This is one's ability to form letters, place letters, and words on a page, and to ensure that the letters and words are the correct size. In order to be able to master the ability to handwrite, there are some performance milestones that must be met. 
Please note that being delayed based on these developmental milestones is not indicative of a learning disorder, but rather just something to be mindful of when you're facilitating the teaching of handwriting. As you can see here, alongside these milestones are skills that parents and educators can also use to help children master handwriting skills. So beginning at zero to Oh, sorry, beginning at 10 to 15 months, children should be able to simply scribble on paper. As a parent, it is encouraged to create an environment where children have a consistent exposure to handwriting tools, such as crayons, pencils, and paper. By age two, children should be able to initiate a horizontal, vertical, circular, or curved line. Building muscle strength in the hands and fingers is the goal during this stage. It's encouraged at this age for parents to provide an atmosphere that builds on these fine motor skills. For example, providing activities for the child is expected to grip or squeeze something in order to gain the strength in their finger muscles that's required for writing. A good way to do this could be to provide your child with something like Play-Doh. By age three, a child should be able to copy different types of lines on a piece of paper. It is important for parents to provide opportunities for writing and coloring. Finally, by age four to five, when students are expected to begin school, they should be able to write some letters and numbers and begin copying their own name. In order to help a child do this, offer them tracing sheets and engage in activities to build hand and finger strength. And that could include continuing to use Play-Doh. And you could use the Play-Doh to form different shapes. So it's common for new writers to struggle with letter formation, spacing, and posture in the beginning, but most are able to produce clear and legible text by the end of second grade. However, there are some children who continue to struggle with the mechanics of writing beyond age seven or eight. For these learners, writing is often slow and labored, and it may cause high levels of stress, frustration, anxiety, and embarrassment at school. Some common handwriting attributes or errors are, uh, they occur regarding letter shape, letter formation, letter size, letter spacing, letter alignment, and line quality, as you can see written on this chart. A poor pencil grip can affect the quality of a child's handwriting, as well as putting unnecessary strain on the hand muscles and ligaments. This causes the hand to tense or cramp and tire quickly, making the handwriting process hard work. Holding a pencil the correct way is a skill that must be taught, nurtured, and supported as a child goes through different stages of motor skill development. The dynamic tripod grasp, the pencil grip that is circled, is the ideal pencil grip for handwriting as it allows children to write comfortably, fluently, and at a decent speed. With different incorrect grasps as seen above, a child may have trouble writing neatly because they lack the fine motor skills or because the position of their hand covers the letters they're writing. However, even though the dynamic tripod pencil grasp is the most effective way for children to hold their pencil, many of us go through life with less than perfect pencil grips and are still able to write with ease. Pencil grip is just something to be mindful of when thinking of handwriting and the demands that come along with the task. Once children are able to write effectively, the next progression in written expression is spelling. Learning to spell is not simply a matter of memorizing letter sequences, but of developing and applying linguistic knowledge as well as knowledge of letter sound relationships and vowel patterns. There are five stages of spelling development that I'll go through now. The first stage is the pre-communicative stage. At this stage, the child uses letters from the alphabet, but shows no knowledge of letter sound correspondence. The child may also lack knowledge of the entire alphabet, the distinction between upper and lowercase letters, and the left or right direction of English orthology. The second stage is the semi-phonetic stage. This is when the child begins to understand letter sound correspondence that sounds are assigned to letters. At this stage, the child often employs limited logic using single letters. For example, to represent words, sound, and syllables, the letter U for U. The example on the slide here is the child's attempt to write, I am playing soccer. 
The third stage is the phonetic stage. Children use a letter or group of letters to represent every speech sound that they hear in a word. Although some of their choices do not conform to conventional English spelling, their attempts to spell words are systematic and easily understood. For example, the letters T-A-K for take and E-N for in. This example on the screen is the child's attempt to write I am picking flowers. The fourth stage is the transitional stage. This is when the speller begins to show a greater understanding of common letter patterns in words and the structure of words. Some examples of misspelling that typically occur at this stage are E-G-U-L for eagle. The fifth stage is the mastery of spelling or it's known as the correct stage. At this stage, spellers know common letter sound relationships and rules for spelling, as well as how to use morphemic information in spelling. Student understands how to spell many common prefixes and suffixes, silent consonants, alternate spellings, and irregular spellings. A large number of learned words are accumulated, and the speller recognizes incorrect words. The progression through each stage is gradual, and the fact that children progress through identifiable identifiable stages in their spelling does not mean that spelling development is spontaneous and will simply unfold naturally without instruction. Therefore, direct instruction in spelling is vital and shapes children's abilities to do so. Some common spelling errors that parents and educators often see are, um, often see and need to be attended to are, letter additions. For example, adding an extra letter like T within the word much. Letter omissions. Missing a letter when writing out the word. So this could be uh, writing the word gate as G-A-T instead of G-A-T-E and it changes the word completely and alters the meaning. Another common spelling error is in sequencing. This is simply not putting the letters in the right order and again can change the meaning of the word completely. Finally, substitutions occur frequently and this is when a student substitutes a letter for another one that sounds similar. For example, putting an S in trace instead of a C because of how the student hears the word. Errors in all of these areas show that foundational grammar rules have not been mastered and should be worked on in a one-to-one -one sitting setting individually with a student or child. After learning to spell, the next step in mastering writing is the ability to make a sentence. As we all know, a sentence is a collection of words that convey sense or meaning and is formed according, according to the logic of grammar. The simplest sentence consists only of a noun, a naming word, and a verb or adjective or action word. For example, in the sentence, Mary walked, Mary is the naming noun, and walked is the action verb, or she is the subject noun, is is the linking verb, and beautiful is an adjective. In order to be able to write sentences, students need to be able to understand and follow grammar patterns and understand all parts of speech. Students should be explicitly taught what each part of speech is, including a noun, pronoun, verb, adjective, article, adverb, adverb, preposition, conjunction, and interjection. In order to write a good paragraph, students need to understand the four essential elements of paragraph writing and how each element contributes to the whole. The four elements essential to good paragraph writing are unity, order, coherence, and completeness. In order to ensure unity, every paragraph must have one single controlling idea that is expressed in its topic sentence, which is typically the first sentence of the paragraph. Order, coherence, and completeness is ensured by organizing supporting sentences and ideas, adding detail, and having a concluding sentence. Let's stop and reflect on what we've just learned. We're going to be taking moments throughout our presentation to stop and review the takeaways from each section. So a review for this one is, a specific learning disorder in written expression is characterized by accuracy in spelling, grammar, inaccuracy in spelling, grammar, and punctuation, along with poor paragraph organization. 
and lack of clarity in written expression. Writing development is a progression, beginning with a simple task of handwriting, followed by spelling, sentence development, and finally paragraph development. Thank you, Ocean, for thoroughly going through the progression of writing. Now we are going to go into the process of writing and the importance of handwriting, memory, executive functioning, and language abilities. So when thinking about the act of spelling, handwriting is one of the best predictors of spelling. Children who have learned on iPads or technology actually do more poorly in spelling than children who learn through pencil and paper. When we think of spelling a word, for example, the word kicked involves orthographic thinking, which is knowing that the letter combination CK never appears at the start of a word. The initial letter KI is more likely. Phonological thinking is thinking about how many sounds are heard. In this case, four sounds are heard. Morphological thinking is looking at those minimal units of words, such as the ending ED would make the word kick past tense. So all these processes come together in spelling. No wonder children have difficulty with this, especially if they have memory or attentional challenges. With technology, handwriting instruction is becoming increasingly marginalized. Handwriting skills predict how much children writes and the quality. It's also important for memory and fine motor skills, as your brain has to navigate fine motor movements, recall letters, words, shapes, and rules. Not to mention to simply see what's on the paper, reading and comprehending what you've written, and predicting what you're going to write next. Parts of the brain becomes more efficient as it learns to automate some of these processes because we don't have to practice making an A over and over again, as after a while we just know. The brain also activates multiple areas of the brain while we write, which is not the case when we type. Our brains have been altered for the better, one could argue, by writing. Taking into consideration everything we've discussed about writing so far, it is clear how complex this task is. Let's explore more of the underlying processes that allow us to understand grammatical rules, spell words correctly, and plan and organize our thoughts using words. These underlying processes are fine motor and visual spatial skills, executive functioning, language abilities, and memory. The first set of processes required for writing are those fine motor and visual spatial skills that Claire briefly discussed. Specifically, in order to handwrite, individuals need to use visual perception, eye-hand coordination, and visual motor integration. As we discussed last week, visual motor integration allows individuals to recognize the common characteristics and orientations of different shapes, while the motor component allows students to move their hand in a wide range of ordered and sequential movements, using small muscles in the hand to form letters and words. Properly developed, the fine motor skills and visual perception allow individuals to write legibly and quickly. When written letters are legible, it's evident that the strokes and or loops of each grapheme are not ambiguous and that the relative letter height is correct in order to avoid confusion during reading. Text legibility is also connected to individuals' abilities to focus, scan, and follow visual cues with their eyes. In contrast, writing fluency is connected to individuals' abilities to use eye-hand coordination while writing. The next process that's implicated in writing is executive functioning. This allows us to focus, divide, switch, and maintain attention, as well it helps us relay information from our working memory into long-term memory. It also aids in goal setting and self-monitoring which is important in an academic setting. Specifically, in the context of writing, these aspects of executive functioning contribute to planning, translating, reading, and editing. Individuals who have difficulties with executive functioning likely will experience challenges with writing. This is likely part of the reason why disorders like ADHD, where executive functioning is impaired, 
commonly co-occur with writing disabilities. Let's discuss the third underlying process of writing, language abilities. Basic language and linguistic functions are critical in the writing process. These include phonological processing, orthographic coding, vocabulary, word finding, sentence syntax, language pragmatics, and reading capabilities. Abbott and Berninger were two of the first researchers who recognized the relationships between oral language or verbal reasoning, word finding, phonological processing, reading, and writing fluency. Bringer and his colleagues also found that orthographic coding, so whole word or letter clusters being able, being able to identify them, had a strong positive correlation with handwriting, spelling, and writing composition. This means that as individuals orthographic coding skills increase, so do their handwriting, spelling, and written composition skills. Various memory functions appear to be important in the writing process. Long-term memory facilitates the extraction of information to be included in the writing task. This includes idea generation, topic knowledge, and understanding who the audience is that you're writing for. Short-term memory is critical for reviewing and revising your writing, and it's important for spelling as well. The mechanism short-term memory are linked to those of long-term memory to facilitate information processing and storage. Difficulties with working memory, long-term memory, and short-term memory are associated with writing difficulties as individuals must retrieve knowledge from their long-term memory, keep information in their short-term memory, and possibly manipulate information using their working memory in order to figure out what to write and how to organize their writing. <clears throat> So let's talk a little bit more about the role of working memory in writing, because it's pretty important. It's important in written expression because it's the function that underlies the active maintenance of multiple ideas, the retrieval of grammatical rules from long-term memory, and self-monitoring that's required during the act of editing and writing. Working memory contributes to the management of these simultaneous processes, and a breakdown in this area may lead to problems with written output. As early as 1996, McChutton found that poor writers typically have reduced working memory capacity when compared to good writers. This is likely due to the role working memory plays within the writing process. Specifically, writing requires individuals to transcribe information from orthology in their minds prior to producing actual physical written output. If this transcription process isn't fluid, it places a more significant demand on working memory. Conversely, Writing fluency can increase the amount of working memory available for higher level writing processes, such as editing. The writing process is a complex combination of skills, which is best taught by breaking down the process. There is a series of steps to follow in producing a finished piece of writing. Research has shown that breaking down the steps to writing helps reduce writer's block. Pre-writing is the planning phase of the writing process, where brainstorming or idea generation is happening. Research is taking place and the structure may be planned out using diagrams and pre-writing. In the writing stage, there, this is where the first draft happens. The ideas are displayed in an organized way through sentences and paragraphs. Students in the revision phase are told to add, delete, rearrange or replace their ideas. The goal here is to improve their draft. Editing is where the fine tuning happens. The students looks at grammar, spelling and punctuation. Finally, the last step is publishing or submitting the work. Let's take a minute to stop and reflect on what we've just learned. There are four processes that underlie writing, fine motor, visual, spatial, skills, executive functioning, language, and memory. We also learned that writing skills develop in four distinct phases. First, we learn to handwrite, then we learn to spell, which is followed by learning to write sentences and eventually transitioning into writing paragraphs. The progression of writing skills becomes even more apparent when we look at the research surrounding the importance of handwriting for developing spelling abilities. Impairments in the underlying processes and skills required to write lead to difficulties producing written compositions.
All right, so the skills and processes we just talked about are used by individuals who are able to efficiently engage in writing skills. However, some children and students have difficulty with writing, which can be based on impairments and underlying neural circuits in the brain. The inferior frontal cortex is important for planning and writing and vocalization. Exner's area is the writing area, and Broca's area is the expressive speech area. The parietal temporal cortex is responsible for the comprehension of written words, such as the auditory representations of phonemes. In the occipital temporal cortex, we get the visual representations of letters. We sometimes call this the letter box. These areas can show a decrease in activation for an individual diagnosed with a learning disorder in written expression. However, with supports and intensive intervention, the neural circuits can become stronger, showing more activation. So what exactly do those characteristics of writing impairment look like? As we've discussed throughout this presentation, students who have difficulties with writing can have them in any of the stages, handwriting, spelling, and composition, and can appear differently for many students. Challenges with handwriting often is due to fine motor difficulties, difficulties remembering motor patterns, and an inability to visualize letters. Graphomotor dysfunction plays into one's ability to handwrite and can be influenced by poor pencil grip, poor muscle coordination, and motor feedback difficulties. This often appears in the classroom as though a student is having trouble tracking their pencil and or their face is too close to the paper. Challenges with spelling can be a result of difficulties analyzing sounds, syllables, and meaningful word parts, difficulties understanding spelling rules, or a lack of phonemic awareness. Phonemic awareness is the ability to hear, identify, and manipulate individual units of sounds. Next is written composition. These challenges, such as ideas that lack logic, missing elements in a story, and lack of transitions is often the result of difficulties with syntax, morphology, and semantics, as previously discussed by Ocean. Next, Ocean is going to go over an activity on what it can feel like for a student with impairment in written expression. We're actually going to stop here for a couple of minutes to do this activity. What I want you all to do is to take out a piece of paper and a pencil or a pen or if you can open up a blank document on your computer that'll work too for this activity i want you to write for two minutes about this question if you could have any superpower what would it be and what seems like a simple question but for this activity i need you to also follow these basic rules you must add a period after every seventh word capitalize every sixth word put quotation marks around every noun spell every four letter word backwards and write with your non-dominant hand or if you're typing type using only your ring fingers oh you don't have to send it to us afterwards it's just an activity for you to kind of understand what might be happening in the child's mind as they're trying to write and they're struggling with keeping in mind all the grammar rules capitalization spelling and all of that all right you guys can stop it's been two minutes now uh thank you for participating i hope you guys now kind of understand some of those difficulties that students might be experiencing if they're having difficulties or challenges writing some of these things i think we take for granted because at our stage at work or in school we've been doing these things for so long and it's been relatively easy for us so it's an activity that's really good to kind of put into perspective what some of these students might be going through okay so where do you go if a child or adolescent is struggling to learn um so what 
What we do if we suspect a student or child is having a learning disability or challenges. Um, for success, individuals with learning disabilities require early identification and timely specialized assessments and interventions involving home, school, community, and workplace settings. If you suspect your child might have a learning disability in written expression or other areas of academics, it will be important to have a thorough evaluation. You can receive this type of evaluation through your local school system or by a psychologist who works in private practice or a medical center. Above all, the evaluation should be your first step in determining treatment. Following through with recommendations is the next step in making sure your child gets the help he or she needs. All right, so where do you go if a child or adolescent is struggling to learn? The first step is to talk to school personnel. School personnel can put some supports in place without an assessment. However, if difficulties persist despite the help provided, an assessment can be requested. In a school, the student will be put on a wait list. If an assessment cannot be completed in a timely manner at the school, it can be completed by a psychologist in private practice or a medical clinic. The website has a list of psychologists in Alberta. You could also search for psychologists in other cities that do psychoeducational assessments. Some resources in Calgary that do psychoeducational assessments are the Integrated Services in Education and Can Learn. All right, let's stop and reflect. As we discussed, there are cortical brain areas of writing that can show a decrease in activation in the areas important for the comprehension of written words in writing. We also talked about common characteristics in writing. For example, fine motor difficulties, difficulties analyzing sounds for spelling, errors in syntax, morphology, or semantics. If you do suspect your child or student has challenges in writing after interventions, we discussed where you could go. we will discuss where you go for an assessment. Since we've already assessed where you go, since we've already discussed where you go for the assessment, now we're going to talk more about what that actual assessment process looks like. For those of you that were here last week for our presentation, this part might be a little bit of a review. All right, so some of you might be wondering what is the psychoeducational assessment and what does it entail? So a psychoeducational assessment occurs when trained professionals investigate your child or student's strengths as well as their areas of difficulty. It's conducted in a holistic manner in which professionals aim to gain a cohesive understanding of your child or student's academic, social, emotional, and behavioral functioning across multiple domains, such as at home, at school, and within the community. This allows professionals to gather necessary information to determine the root cause of your child or student's difficulties. It also helps to inform recommendations or suggestions that can be utilized to help your child or students enhance their skill set in areas that are personally challenging for him or her. A typical psychoeducational assessment consists of four primary parts, the intake meeting, the cognitive testing, academic testing, and additional testing. The first part of an intake meeting involves discussing the client's legal rights, limits to confidentiality, and the actual assessment process. So what's involved, the types of assessments the psychologist would like to conduct, and what each of those assessments will be investigating. They'll also seek your permission to conduct these assessments, as well as to possibly conduct a classroom observation and interview your child's teachers and or medical doctors. The following step of the intake meeting involves clarifying the purpose of the assessment. This is why parents and or teachers are seeking the psychoeducational assessment for their child or student. This is where a psychologist will verify the specific referral questions with parents. These questions are a way of specifically communicating what is being investigated during the assessment process. Additionally, psychologists will also ask questions about what parents hope to gain from a psychoeducational assessment. 
if they want things like supports and resources for their child, perhaps a diagnosis, or maybe just a better understanding of their child's strengths and areas of difficulty. After the referral questions are determined, the psychologist will proceed to the history taking step. Throughout this step, the psychologist will ask questions about the child's developmental history, their cognitive, academic, and social emotional behavioral functioning across the lifespan from birth until present time. They'll also ask specific questions pertaining to your child's behavior at home, at school, and in the community when he or she is partaking in a favorite activity and any differences in functioning when he or she is completing a non-preferred task. They'll also ask for examples of your child's strengths and they'll seek to understand things that interest and motivate your child. This information will be used to make sure your child is comfortable during the individual testing sessions that will occur with a psychologist during the cognitive, academic, and additional testing days. All right, so the next step in the psychoeducational assessment process is one that most parents and teachers are aware of, cognitive testing. Most people view this as intelligence or IQ testing that provides information about how smart someone is. While this is a somewhat accurate depiction of cognitive assessments, it's important to understand a couple crucial details. One, the full-scale IQ quotient, which is what individuals are referring to when they discuss IQ, is a summary of an individual's abilities to use five different types of cognitive reasoning. It's only one part of what we call an individual's cognitive profile. Two, an individual's cognitive profile is a description of his or her strengths and areas of challenge using specific types of cognitive reasoning. And three, this type of information allows professionals to tailor specific recommendations and supports towards your child or student's specific strengths to address his or her areas of needs within the classroom, at home, or within the community. Now let's briefly overview the five types of cognitive reasoning. Verbal reasoning is a child's ability to take in verbal information, use words to compare ideas, and explain what they know. Visual spatial reasoning helps individuals design, draw, build, and navigate their environment. Fluid reasoning is the ability to think about patterns, sequences, and quantities. While working memory is an individual's ability to hold simple auditory or visual information in their mind and then manipulate it in order to determine an answer to a question. Processing speed, the fifth type of cognitive reasoning, measures how accurately and quickly individuals can understand information to complete a task. Difficulties in certain areas of cognitive reasoning, such as processing speed, in which individuals must copy specific shapes quickly and accurately, can be indicative of graphomotor difficulties that are sometimes present in writing. These types of difficulties include having trouble distinguishing the visual appearance of the shape, for example, drawing an O and not recognizing that the circle isn't completely closed, having difficulties recognizing specific letters and retrieving information about their shape and form from memory. This can appear as if students and children have difficulty, re difficulty remembering how to spell letters. If this occurs, they might start and then stop writing letters in a word, or they might retrace parts of a letter in a word. And sometimes if you examine their written work, they might write a letter one way within a word. And then if it occurs again in the same word, they might write it completely differently. Or they might experience difficulties executing specific motor movements, sequences of movements required to form letters or shapes in an eligible manner and or have difficulty holding a pencil or writing instrument properly like we previously discussed. All right, so the next step in the psychoed assessment process is academic testing. This assessment will investigate your child or student's abilities across three primary domains, reading, writing, and mathematics. Please keep in mind that throughout all of this testing, your child's performance in each of these areas are assessed according to his or her grade level. Since we discussed these areas broadly last week, we'll be focusing more in depth on writing today. Specific areas of writing that are evaluated are 
grammar. Your child's ability to write sentences contain proper syntax and morphology. So syntax is your child or student's ability to properly organize words within a sentence to ensure that it conveys proper meaning. And morphology is your child or student's abilities to understand and manipulate morphemes. So those are the smallest units of speech in a language that contain meaning. For example, understanding that the word books consists of two meaningful units of speech, book, and the suffix s. This suffix is used to make the word plural, thus indicating that there's more than one book. Mechanics is another area that's assessed for writing. This is your child or student's abilities to use proper spelling, capitalization, and punctuation. The next one is spelling. This is your student's abilities to accurately spell words. Writing fluency, how quickly and accurately your child can write simple sentences. And then written expression, your child or student's ability to generate ideas, organize and structure their writing with things like an introductory and concluding paragraph, as well as their abilities to use topic sentences to start paragraphs and transitioning sentences when moving from one paragraph to the next. Next week, discuss the areas of math that are investigated during a psychoeducational assessment, so be sure to check out that presentation. All right, so additional testing is sometimes required in order to rule out potential diagnoses. Sometimes academic difficulties can be the result of underlying challenges in areas such as executive functioning, social emotional behavioral functioning, adaptive functioning, or sometimes even issues using fine motor skills or even difficulties with language processing. Let's explore these areas in a little bit more detail. All right, so executive functioning refers to a set of mental skills that work together to help direct, manage, regulate, and control a person's cognitions and behaviors towards achieving goals. In the context of writing, if a child is struggling with executive functioning, it might interfere with his or her abilities to engage in pre-writing skills such as planning and organizing what they're going to write. Additionally, these difficulties might also impact a child or student's abilities to focus their attention and follow multiple steps required to come up with ideas and translate them into written form on paper. Expressing ideas in written form requires accessing knowledge of how to spell words, how to construct sentences with proper syntax and grammar, and how to use proper mechanics such as punctuation and capitalization. So social emotional behavioral functioning refers to an individual's abilities to make and maintain relationships with others such as friends, peers, and family, as well as their abilities to regulate their emotions and behaviors. These three areas of functioning are crucial for, main for maintaining optimal mental well-being. And then students, sometimes if they're experiencing difficulties in writing, they might show this by having emotional outbursts, by being angry or crying, or sometimes they might try to avoid academic work that involves writing. And adaptive functioning. This refers to a student's ability to engage in everyday living tasks. These tasks are categorized within three domains conceptual, so an individual's abilities to use and understand language, the abilities to perform basic math, reading, and writing required for everyday living. And then we have social, participating in leisure activities or using skills required to maintain friendships, such as recognizing and responding to others' emotions. And then practical, completing chores around the house, maintaining one's personal hygiene are examples of this type of adaptive functioning skill. If a student experiences marked difficulties across these three domains of daily living skills, it's likely that he or she will have trouble learning how to write, especially if he or she demonstrates difficulties understanding those basic functional academic skills. Visual motor assessments. They investigate students' abilities to both understand and use visual information to produce replications of specific geometric designs. Difficulties performing this type of task can manifest as difficulties with handwriting. For example, writing letters with improper form and or not placing proper spacing between letters and words in written composition. 
Group language assessments can sometimes be done to explore students' use of expressive, so verbal and receptive. So this is nonverbal language, such as pointing. And this is done to determine students' understanding of basic vocabulary, words, or concepts. This is important as students experiencing difficulties comprehending and using language might struggle with subjects across the curriculum due to the extensive use of language required to listen to instructions, uh, complete assignments, or respond to questions in class. Difficulties understanding language may present challenges for students who are learning to read and write and do math, as they will likely have trouble understanding and demonstrating the sounds that specific letters make. And if they have trouble identifying the sounds that they make and mapping them to letters, it'll also lead to difficulties potentially with learning how to write the letters and knowing where the letters go within specific words when they're spelling. All right, so this might seem a little bit ironic, but now we're gonna do a recap of what we reviewed from last week. It's time to stop and reflect on what we've just relearned. There are four primary parts in the psychoeducational assessment process, an intake meeting, cognitive testing, academic testing, and additional testing. Additional testing sometimes occurs in the areas of executive functioning, social emotional behavioral functioning, adaptive functioning, visual motor integration, and language development. All psychoeducational testing is conducted to understand your child or student's academic profile. Psychologists are able to do this by using the different tests mentioned above to collect evidence of your child or student's strengths and areas of difficulty. This information is then used when determining which empirical recommendations will address your child or student's unique learning needs. It's important to note that learning disabilities often co coexist with various conditions, including attentional, behavioral, and emotional disorders, sensory impairments, or other medical conditions, which further adds to academic difficulties. The most common co-occurring disorder is ADHD. This is why, as Ocean discussed in the assessment process, we often look at multiple areas of functioning that includes behavioral, emotional, and academic. There are a few measurement techniques used in psychoeducational reports that are norm referenced and standardized to help understand the report. We went over this last week, but for those of you who are new that is joining us this week, I'll go over it briefly. During the standardization process, the test is given to a large number of students from various backgrounds to determine what is average, low average, high average, etc. This allows us to compare a child's score to thousands of other students who are part of the normative sample. So we can say Johnny is doing as well as students his age. Norms can be reported as percentile ranks, which is on the bottom of this graph. A percentile rank of 60 corresponds to a performance that is as good as or better than 60% of one same aged peers. Average percentile ranks fall between 25 and 75. Standard scores estimate whether a student's score are above average, average, or below average compared to peers. You might hear terms such as Johnny is one standard deviation below the mean. So if the average is at 100, one standard deviation below is 90. A child or adolescent struggling in writing would be usually about two standard deviations from the mean in the extremely low to low range on this graph. This is an example of an assessment done with a grade four girl. For her cognitive assessment, she had scores in the low average to average range. So we would expect her academic scores to be around the low average to average range. However, we can see she is struggling quite a bit with some writing skills, specifically spelling, grammar, and coming up with ideas and elaborating on those ideas. Spelling was in the sixth percentile. So looking on the graph that would be on the left side, two standard deviations below the mean. In sentence composition, 
I asked the student to verbally tell me her idea and work through elaborating on that idea with her. She was able to do so, and then we wrote it down together. She was able to perform better with this modification. However, when she wrote it on paper, the sentence did not make sense because of her grammar and spelling errors. This student was diagnosed with a moderate learning disorder in written expression because she was struggling in school and specifically on the assessment, she was two standard deviations below her peers when writing. Recommendations included developing stronger early reading skills and sight word vocabulary to help with spelling before working on her sentence structure. All right, so this is a sample from the grade four student writing about what she did when she got home from school. The student struggled with messy and slow handwriting. This took the student about one hour to complete. As we can see, the student has poor spelling, which makes this piece of writing quite difficult to read. There are some issues with letter form processing. For example, the mix up of capital letters with lowercase letters. She had difficulty getting her thoughts on paper as after writing this, she said that was all she could think of. There is poor spacing between the letters and words. And finally, because her pencil grip was poor, it caused fatigue in her hand and the added pressure on the paper also creates fatigue. Claire nicely explained to you guys already kind of how we would go through assessing the written composition part of an academic assessment. Um, but now I'll talk more generally about that diagnostic decision making model that we try to follow. So this diagnostic decision making process begins once a psychologist receives your case file. This information will guide the questions they ask at an intake meeting. Then based on the information gathered at the meeting, psychologists will determine potential diagnoses that are important to explore in order to gain a comprehensive understanding of how your child or student functions at home, at school, and within the community. Moving on to step number two, the list of possible diagnoses being queried will guide the specific assessments that are chosen. Through these assessments, the psychologist will gather information, which we refer to as evidence. This evidence will be used during steps three and four. In step three, the psychologist will critically evaluate all the evidence from testing, including both students' responses to questions, as well as their behavior across domains in order to comprehensively understand how your child or student is functioning each day in multiple environments. This was evident in the example that Claire went through when she was talking about not only the written output that the student produced, but also how her behavior impacted her performance, like how she was holding the pencil made her really fatigued. <clears throat> and then the information that's gathered at this stage will help the psychologist determine which of the hypothesized difficulties do not accurately explain the challenges your child or student is experiencing, and these conditions will be ruled out. Going off of the previous example, difficulties with visual motor integration and language processing disorders should be evaluated prior to moving towards possibly diagnosing a specific learning disorder with impairment in written expression. Following this process, in step number four, the psychologist will review the gathered evidence to determine if there's enough information to support diagnosing any of the remaining conditions that were hypothesized. Sometimes there's sufficient evidence to make one or more diagnoses. Other times the information collected does not align with criteria within the DSM-5 or LDAP, and as a result, it is inappropriate to provide a diagnosis. When a child is diagnosed with a learning disorder or disability in writing, a code is given. It looks like there's some technical difficulties. All right, there we go. 
Um, so a code for a learning disability is a code 54 in Alberta. If a child or student has multiple diagnoses, the diagnosis that most interferes with school will be the code that is written down. An example of this may be if a child is diagnosed with both ADHD and a learning disability. The school may decide to focus on the student's ADHD first if it is impacting the student's ability to learn and pay attention before working on academic areas. The code is given so that additional supports may be determined at any time during the school year. It is the responsibility of school authority staff to assign a special education code to a student which is based on documentation. An assessment is designed to offer guidance to school authorities regarding Alberta education's expectations for assessment practices and is done by psychologists in a psychoeducational assessment. The code allows schools to ensure appropriate interventions of specific skill instruction, accommodations, compensatory strategies, and self-advocacy skills. skills. As parents and teachers, if there needs to be a modification to the IPP, it is important to self-advocate for a meeting with school staff to look over the IPP to make modifications. So there was a question about IPP planning during the pandemic. So in order to get information on this, I interviewed a teacher who is currently working at Calgary Catholic District School Board. IPP planning for online learning is a little different because you won't be able to have that in-person support at home. However, the instruction and activities are developmentally appropriate. There are strategies that can still be implemented in online learning, such as extra time, reduced questions, visual pairings with written instructions and assignments, um, installing text-to-speech software, to name a few. When switching to online learning, it is important to meet with the school and discuss the IPP. All activities are structured around the student's IPP and grade level of programming so that the student may get a more developmentally appropriate assignment to complete. So let's stop and reflect on what we just learned. The standardized testing ensures that comparisons can be drawn between a child and similar aged peers. Percentile scores are presented on a standardized distribution or the bell curve. There are four main steps in diagnostic decision making that Ocean discussed and students diagnosed with a learning disorder are given a code by the school, which helps with providing supports. Next, we'll be talking about self-regulated learning. What is it? This is the ability to manage one's cognitions, behaviors, and affects, so their emotions, attitudes, and beliefs while learning. Students who utilize regulated learning engage in goal-oriented behaviors, such as implementing learning strategies and skills to assist in monitoring, organizing, and managing their abilities to learn. Through this process, students often learn to manage their time, focus their attention, and reduce their anxiety. These strategies and skills have been linked to positive student outcomes such as resiliency and enhanced mental well-being. Typically, self-regulated learning occurs in three recursive phases. Students start by accessing prior knowledge to inform their goal setting. They set a goal and create a plan regarding how to achieve their goal. This plan often involves using specific strategies. During the next phase, students will implement specific strategies and monitor their progress towards goal fulfillment. Then in the third phase, they evaluate their performance, and if it isn't satisfactory, they'll modify their strategies to ensure they can fulfill their goal. Now that we understand self-regulated learning a little bit better, let's explore the self-regulated strategy development framework. Research has shown that students with specific learning disorders benefit from explicit 
direct instruction and metacognitive strategy instruction, being taught how to manage their thoughts while learning. More specifically, students who have a learning disorder typically achieve higher academic outcomes if they're taught using both explicit instruction and metacognitive instruction. One way to incorporate both of these instructional techniques while teaching is to use a self-regulated strategy development framework to guide your lesson planning and instruction. Self-regulated strategy development is a specific instructional framework that employs explicit instruction in learning and self-regulation strategies. Learning strategies are specific to the academic skill being taught, whereas self-regulation strategies support and encourage students' use of the learning strategies in completing academic tasks. Commonly in the literature, these two types of strategies are combined. This framework provides a structure for teaching learning and self-regulation strategies that may be applied across content areas, grade levels, and student abilities. There are six distinct phases of the self-regulated strategy development framework. Now we'll discuss each of those phases in more detail. Phase number one. This is development or activation of background knowledge. During this phase, teachers determine whether students have background knowledge or prerequisite skills needed to apply a specific reading, writing, or mathematical learning strategy. This is done through discussion, observation, curriculum-based measures, pre-assessments, or examination of students' work samples. They also help students set goals. The teachers present an overview of the learning strategy and introduce self-regulation strategies that will be taught throughout the following phases of the framework. Teachers introduce visual aids for the learning strategy during instruction and post them in the classroom as well. Phase number two. This is discussing the strategy. The purpose of the stage is to promote students' motivation and help them understand the importance of the learning strategy. Teachers will ask students to commit to using the strategy and the self-regulation techniques. Sometimes teachers will even have students sign a contract for learning to show they're committed to using the specific strategy. Following this step, teachers will meet with students individually to provide them with information about their present performance based upon earlier work, and then they'll help them set goals for their academic tasks based on the activity, and they'll help them plan a strategy to use. A goal might be something like answering a specific number of math problems correctly. Students graph their baseline performance and monitor it on the graph as they work towards completing their goals. Near the end of this phase, teachers will begin to introduce various tasks and situations where students can apply the strategy. So you're generalizing your skill development in using that strategy. Further examples of how the strategies can be generalized continue throughout the remaining of the entire framework. And then in phase three, teachers will model the specific steps required to use the self-regulation or a learning strategy by verbalizing the thinking process or by thinking aloud as they apply the strategy. Teachers will mod model self-instruction and how to use specific tools such as graphic organizers and charts while implementing the specific strategy. They'll also model self-assessment using a checklist to document each step they used. And then they'll model uh, graphing performance, and then they'll discuss whether or not they've met their goal. If the learners don't meet their goal, they'll discuss with the teacher what steps they can take to improve their progress towards completing the goal. And then after modeling, teachers will explain what self-assessments are and why they're important. And then teachers might also instruct students to record their self-statements for future use. Phase number four, this is called Memorize It. During this phase, teachers will evaluate through the use of verbal or sometimes written quizzes, how well students have memorized specific steps required to use a self-regulation or learning strategy. If students are unable to list and describe each step, teachers may include activities such as songs, games, or quizzing to support memorizing the different steps. Phase five involves supporting students by granting them opportunities to practice their self-regulation or learning strategies. This can be done via collaborative practice, 
teacher peer prompting for next steps or frequent guidance during practice. Students also use visual aids such as checklists or graphic organizers during this stage. Teachers will modify, monitor students' performance and decrease supports as students become more independent in applying the learning and self-regulation strategy. If students have difficulty applying strategies without support, teachers will reteach lessons in the areas in which the students are struggling. The final phase. By this stage, the goal is for students to be able to use their self-regulation or learning strategies independently. How great is that? Students should be able to apply the strategy without use of visual aids or charts. However, students are encouraged to write acronyms for the learning strategy on their papers. Teachers continue to monitor students' performance at this stage in order to determine the proper use of the strategy and the, the student's progress towards goal fulfillment. If students are not using strategies appropriately, for example, if they're skipping steps or if they're not using self-regulation strategies when they should be, or they're not making progress towards their goals, teachers may reteach or supply additional supported practice to these students. And then if students surpass their goals, teachers may consider enrichment activities that encourage students to further build upon their skills and strategy use. So some examples of specific self-regulated learning strategies for writing include POW and TREE. As you can see, POW stands for P, pick my ideas, O, organize my notes, and W, write and say more. This strategy is typically helpful for helping students initiate a writing task. Once the strategy is mastered and students are expected to engage in more difficult writing exercises, they can advance to using writing strategies aimed at guiding the writing process. If a student is learning how to create an opinion essay, they might use the strategy TREE. TREE stands for T, topic sentence, R, reasons, E, ending, and E, examine. This helps students create opinion essays that contain a topic sentence or thesis statement which contains their opinion. They follow it up with three main reasons and supporting evidence, summarize all their ideas in a concluding paragraph, and evaluate their written output to ensure all the necessary parts of the essay are included. All right, so we're just going to quickly go over some recommendations and suggestions. Um, we're going to start with the foundational recommendations in writing and work our way through more complex processes in writing. These are not exhaustive, but are just some recommendations that you would most often start with. To start off, we'll go over handwriting recommendations. Research has shown that 50 to 100 minutes of handwriting instruction per week, along with daily practice, is optimal. Handwriting instruction may include how to form letters or comparing and contrasting letter features, such as noticing straight lines and circles in certain letters. Modeling is very helpful, especially with pencil grip, paper position, and letter formation. Often, it is recommended for students to trace letters first and then copy and use visual cues to form letters. Facilitative support may include lined or graph paper. The Handwriting Without Tears is a popular program for younger students to learn handwriting through kinesthetic, visuals, and eventually putting that to paper. Um, so we're going to skip the video due to time, um, but the link will be in the presentation that will be posted. All right, so next I'll talk about spelling recommendations, which is tied into reading. Phonological awareness is so important. For example, knowing how many syllables a word has. It is also important to teach spelling rules. For example, high frequency words with irregular spelling. One strategy that can be used, and you can make little reminder cards for your student or child, is the five-step word study strategy. 
The student is given the word box and first they say the word, write and say the word, check the word, trace and say the word, and write the word from memory and check. One intervention that is online is the CASL, Handwriting Spelling Program. We also have a video that shows how to use explicit instruction of phonological awareness and spelling rules. In Stacy Cicero's primary classroom, students are examining the reciprocal relationship between spelling and reading words by using the spelling to complement reading instructional practice. Here's the word, time, repeat it. In this practice, students must isolate the phonemes in a spoken word and match those phonemes to the graphemes that represent them. Colleen just showed me yes. You take the silent E, it doesn't make a sound, so we're putting it right outside of the sound box. In the first part of this instructional practice, students listen to a spoken word. Prime. Say the word. Prime. And then segment the phonemes in the word. They determine the number of sounds in the word and print the spelling of each sound using the boxes of their soundboards. Check your soundboard to make sure each sound is in each box. How many sounds are in the word prime? Students determined that the word prime has four phonemes but is spelled with five letters. So which soundboard am I going to use? The one with three boxes or four? Justice. I should use four. The teacher and students analyze letter to sound connections using the soundboard. B e. e would be the next one, but justice. I don't have any more sound boxes. It doesn't go in a box. It just hangs out there? Why does it hang out there? Because if it doesn't say its name, it's not supposed to go in a sound box. It doesn't have a sound, does it? But it helps what? It helps the eye say its name. It helps the eye say its name. Great. Prime. Check your boxes. To wrap up the lesson, Students hear the words again and write them from memory. Okay, here comes the next word. Bribe. This gives students further practice with the sound spelling pattern and provides the teacher with immediate feedback. Tap it. For students, understanding the relationship between spelling a word and reading a word helps them cement letter to sound connections. All right, so we worked a lot this morning on Silent E. I am so proud of you. There's a lot of hard work. So drawing upon what we learned earlier, it's important to use those self-regulated strategy development framework to help students acquire and use self-regulated learning strategies for sentence and paragraph writing. Some of these common strategies might be acronyms like MEAL. M means main idea, E is for evidence, A is for analysis, L is for linking your ideas to the main topic, or race. R is restate the question, A is answer the question, C is cite the evidence that supports your answer, and E is explain how the evidence supports your answer. Or peel, P is for point, so make your point. E is for evidence, so provide evidence. The other E is for explanation, so explain how the evidence supports your point. And then L, L is for link the point to the next point in the paragraph. Another helpful strategy is the powers. Tell the student that main ideas that form topic sentences are the first power. Supporting sentences that say something about power one sentence. And then additional supporting sentences say something about the power two sentence. And finally, power four is the concluding sentences that reviews what you wrote about in the paragraph. And then visual support, such as the hamburger graphic organizer on the slide, can be used as a reminder of the proper structure for a paragraph. One of the main ways you can help students with essay and report writing is to use self-regulated learning strategies for writing. This is particularly useful for expository writing. Expository writing is any type of written work that requires the author to describe or explain a specific concept or opinion. 
Common examples of expository forms of writing include essays, reports, newspapers, and magazine articles, instructional manuals, and textbooks. Effective expository writing requires metacognitive knowledge of the processes of planning, pre-writing, drafting, and revising, as well as the ability to use text structure to organize and improve written composition. Unfortunately, many students, especially those with learning disabilities, have a limited understanding of the processes involved in expository writing, and therefore experience challenges using text structures to create well-organized written compositions. One way to assist students with this is by making the process more explicit via direct instruction, and that's done by following phases of the self-regulated strategy development framework we discussed earlier to teach writing strategies such as power. P is for plan. O is for organize, W is for write, E is for evaluate, and R is for review or revise. Or review and revise. Or another strategy could be plan, P, pay attention to the prompt, L, list main idea, A, add supporting ideas, N, number your ideas. An additional one is write, W is for work from your plan to develop your thesis statement. R is remember your goals. I is include transition words for each paragraph. T is try to use different kinds of sentences. And E is exciting words in your essay. And then the previously discussed strategies, POW and TREE are also appropriate here. And then graphic organizers, such as the Oreo persuasive writing one shown on the slide, and the funnel structure of an essay can help guide students through the essay and report writing process. There are also blank graphic organizers available on the web that students can use to fill in their main ideas for each necessary section of a reporter essay. This can then be used as a checklist as he or she engages in writing their formal report or essay. We talked about a lot today, and so some key takeaways are that we must be aware of the multiple terms for a specific learning disorder and written expression. Sometimes this is called developmental output failure, writing disorder, writing problems, disorder of written expression, problems in written expression, writing disabilities, or dysgraphia. Difficulties in one or more of the four areas of writing, so handwriting, spelling, sentence and paragraph composition, despite supports in the classroom, may indicate a learning disorder in written expression. We learn that specific cortical areas of the brain, such as Exner's and Broca's area, the parietal temporal cortex and the occipital temporal cortex help us in writing, and an impairment in these areas may be related to some writing challenges. That being said, with appropriate supports and intensive intervention, the neural circuits can become stronger, showing more activation. And since every child's learning profile is unique, we tailor supports and recommendations to their specific needs. And this is done through a comprehensive psychoeducational assessment. Students with a learning disorder and written expression will receive a special education code, and this code ensures that the student will receive supports throughout their education uh, through the use of an individual through the use of an individualized program plan, also known as an IPP. And then next up is just some slides with all the references we use throughout the presentation. Thank you everyone for taking the time to listen to us today. Our presentation and an additional resource page will be provided upon request. We're also open to answer any questions you may have from our presentation. If we're unable to answer any of your questions today, please join us next week. Um, if we're unable to answer any of your questions today, please drop them in the chat box and then we'll answer them next week. And be sure to check out our presentation next Wednesday on specific learning disorders with impairments in mathematics.